Hello, I'm Tom Butcher at the Zero Project Conference in Vienna, and I'm joined today by Elaine Katz of the Kessler Foundation. Elaine, where actually are you? Are you in New Jersey or Washington? We're or in New Jersey, next to New York, with yeah. a rainy day. Oh, great. <laughs> well, actually, not great. It's okay here, but at least we haven't got any rain. Um, Elaine, before we start in on the meat of our discussion, could you please tell, um, particularly for our viewers, a wee bit about the um, Kessler Foundation and yourself and what you do there? Sure. Um, so Kessler Foundation, as I said, is based in uh, New Jersey, and we change the lives of people with disabilities through rehabilitation research and funding employment initiatives. Our research really focuses on improving cognition and mobility for individuals with disabilities such as spinal cord injury, traumatic brain injury, stroke, and we look to improve daily functioning and independence by testing new interventions, which can really lead to independence. Um, I head our um, external grant making program. I'm senior vice president of grants and communications. And what that program does is fund disability programs in the US um, that really increase the participation rates of people with disabilities. Um, and we fund all different kinds of um, projects, but really we're known for our innovation and our large grants. So through innovation, we hope to really change the field and um, make, you know, advocacy for people with disabilities. Great. Thank you very much indeed. So that I understand a, a little bit more when you are, when we're talking about funding, could you put that in the context of um, perhaps framing disability and inclusion in the U.S.? Sure. So we are working in giving out grants to organizations that are really trying to increase inclusion for uh, people with disabilities. So as you really think about it, um, there's about 61 million people with disabilities in the U.S. That's about one in four or 26 percent of people. And although we enjoy protections under the disabilities, um, under the Americans for Disabilities Act, really um, you know, there's still a lot of barriers. So in 1990, the U.S. signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, which led to economic independence and equal access to employment. But still, you know, we didn't sign the convention and there's still a lot of barriers and recognition. And now we have COVID of, um, you know, inclusion in the U.S. So when we think about inclusion, we're really talking more than just physical integration. Um, you know, people can be present but not included. Um, people with disabilities often lack opportunities to play and learn and be employed um, and be active in the community, the same as people without disabilities. And I, I think what's really, um, I, I like to um, quote, um, something from a report that came um, in 1994 called Beyond the Ramp. And the quote is from this Australian report. It says, presence without participation can be more isolating than no presence at all. So, you know, it's really important to include people with disability and inclusion. And we do work uh, mainly in employment to include people, but we've been involved also um, with health. Um, uh, one last thing about inclusion, I would say, um, this past December, on December 3rd, President Biden um, issued a briefing statement, which is also known as the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. And the briefing statement had three key points. One of it is Sarah Mancara, who I know is attending this conference and is yeah. a good friend. Um, is this, she was appointed as a special advisor on international disability rights. Um, there's also going to be attention for access to voting for people with disabilities. And lastly, there's going to be even greater initiative for disability inclusion and hiring across the U.S. government. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and, you know, to, to, to continue with that, um, when we're looking at inclusion and representation in the workplace, um, say, pre-COVID and post-COVID, what do you think the implications are in terms of change post-COVID? 
Well, I think it's really important to look at employment, um, you know, what happened before COVID, um, because that yeah. puts it yeah. more in context. And it, at least in the U.S. Um, pre-COVID, there was almost employment at full capacity, which meant employers were starting to look at other populations for employment, such as people with disabilities, people who are formerly incarcerated. Um, and I'll still, we did see though that diversity was, uh, people with disabilities are not included in a diversity definition of equality. And we never really saw um, true accommodations. We saw accommodations were af an afterthought. Um, Kessler Foundation had a survey in 2015, and uh, we found that people with disabilities were really striving to work. Um, and when we did a survey in 2017, along with the University of New Hampshire, we with, and that survey was with supervisors and their attitudes towards hiring people with disabilities. What we found is that, you know, the attitudes of a manager really represented the attitudes of their supervisors. So, you know, given that, there wasn't a lot of hiring of people with disabilities. And then, of course, COVID hit, and we had this enormous shutdown and response. And the Office of Disability Employment Policy in the U.S. saw in the first six months almost one million um, people with disabilities that were let go of their jobs. Um, you know, there's a saying that that is the um, last hired, the first fired. And we we really saw that, um, that people with disabilities were the hardest hit group, especially when we uh, looked into some of the numbers, um, people of um, underserved populations, which include Latinx and also non-Hispanic black populations in the U.S. So that really, um, you know, Gives, sets the stage for where we are in the pandemic and the early stages. And of course, as we move later on, um, you know, and we look where we are now, um, we produce a report called the National Trends in Disability Employment with the University of New Hampshire. And when we looked at the January numbers, and these numbers are extrapolated from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistic numbers uh, that are produced on the first Friday of the month called Jobs Friday. Yeah. The numbers now of people with disabilities who are working have really surpassed and, and reached the same level they were um, at pre-pandemic. So we've seen a five-month high of people with disabilities who have stayed in the workplace. And we think part of the reason for that is people with disabilities were really essential workers. So if you think about the jobs, even though they're not great jobs and they're not the jobs we want people with disabilities ne necessarily to have, but they're in food service, um, they may also be in cleaning, they also may be um, workers in, for example, supermarkets, these low-level jobs are really essential uh, during the early days of the pandemic. Great, thank you. Um, and as an extension, that the uh, extension of that, um, there's one thing which um, I have been thinking about over, well, particularly over the time of the, the pandemic, which is, yes, we have seen um, an increase in the number of persons um, with disabilities employed not least because, from what I understand, quite a few are employed remotely. And mm -hmm. there has been, okay, anecdotally for me anyway, an increase in the number of people who are uh, employed remotely. But employment remotely, I personally don't consider to be any substitute for employment actually in the workplace where one um, has time and it interacts with, 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 with one's peers. Um, is, is that correct, do you think? Or, or do you think my perception is wrong? Well, we could have a real debate about that, I guess. Oh, I'd love to. Um, there, was, <laughs> there was just an article in the New York Times this week, um, that large newspaper in the US, which talked about how CEOs of major corporations want everybody back in the office. Um, and I think one of the permanent changes from COVID is flex time. Um, flex time where people do not want to be in the office 100% of the time, or if they are, they at least want the option to be able to work remotely. And you know, for individuals with disabilities, there was quite a lot of advantages for working remotely if those fit, fit those jobs. You know, the transportation barriers were eliminated, for example. Um, if you needed to take medication or take breaks during the day, you could work a little bit, um, you know, take your break, 
or even work in the evening. So you had that flexibility. Um, also, you know, disabilities that were evident were oftentimes hidden when you're on a Zoom screen. If, for example, if you're a wheelchair user, um, I, I think there were socialization opportunities that were through Zoom or either, um, you know, through um, Teams as we're using today that really lend themselves to being part of that group. But the issue becomes, and what you raise is a very interesting point, when people do go back to the office, do they lose that flexibility now? Are people expected to be in all the time? Um, you know, does the technology that improves so much and helps with accessibility, is that going to go away? Is it, you know, now really technology, accessibility are not seen as accommodations. It was seen during COVID as necessary to do your job. What happens when you know, we go back to the office. And a, a critical question that we found is that we're working with Microsoft uh, AI for accessibility on a project with OCAD University in Ontario, which looks at what are the discrimination when algorithms are used in, to screen out job applicants online. As we know, everybody now is interviewing online. And what does that mean for someone who um, has a disability, may have a gap in a work history, may not be able to maintain eye contact um, during an interview. How does that affect um, their ability to be hired at a company? And this is, at least in, this, in the United States right now, is really jobs from supermarkets to, you know, tech companies. It's not necessarily just the professionals. McDonald's was interviewing um, online. So it's it's not just, um, it's really everybody right now. Great. Thank you very much. We're, we're, we're drawing to a close, but before we actually get to that close, I'd like to ask you um, if you had to use all the experience in everything that you're doing, well, I'm not going to ask you to use that experience in everything that you do, um, to give a call to action. What do you see people should be doing? And for you, especially over this last horrendous couple of years, um, what have you seen? You've got to sort this out. This is what you've got to do. I see this is the way forward. I'm afraid I've put you a wee bit on the spot. No, no. Uh, so, so I think the way forward and the call to action really is what we're seeing now, is that employers are looking for good, good um, employees. Um, they're looking to retain employees. They're looking to hire new employees. And people with disabilities are part of that pool that need to be considered. Uh, we also have a project with the um, Society of Human Resource Managers called SHRM, the international organization that works with uh, human resource managers on hiring. And we're putting together a certificate, which will be free, open to anybody in the world. Um, hopefully that will come online in the spring. And that gives uh, somebody who wants to hire an individual disability information. You know, what is a disability? How do you onboard somebody? How do you supervise somebody? What do you need to make sure of with etiquette? So I think there are resources out there um, for companies that want to hire good employees. Um, you know, and, and as somebody with a disability, just like everybody else, they can they can be promoted, they can be um, hired, they can not do a good job, they could do a great job. So we don't want to, you know, say there's really any difference, but they make a really good employee and, and somebody that should be considered for a position when there's an opening. And, and within the... Um, disability community itself, there's lots of diversity, lots of diversity on styles, on people, on experience. And I think, um, you know, that would be my call to action, that it's the time is right to consider people with disabilities as part of your diversity initiatives uh, when you go to hire. Great. Elaine, thank you very much. Um, I would love to carry on this discussion more. Um, maybe when I'm back in New York, I actually live in um, Ohio now, but I will pop by. And um, for everybody watching me, please do go on to the website of the Kessler Foundation. It's really fascinating. And you'll find out more about what um, Elaine does there and what the foundation does there. But I would just like to say thanks so much for joining to me today. I wish you'd been here personally, but to be able to see you on screen, that's absolutely great. Um, it's not, you know, it's not first best, it's second best, but thank you so much, Elaine. And um, as they say, have a nice day for the rest of it. <laughs>
<laughs> you too, Tom. It was great to meet you. If I had known uh, Austria was going to have these vaccination, rigorous uh, vaccination, yeah. maybe I would have considered going. Oh, well, so come... again, thank you again. And it's been delightful to meet you. And yes, we should carry on the conversation. In... And I'm happy to really chat with anybody uh, who needs some more information about the work we do. Great. Get in touch with um, Elaine, please. And Elaine, we look forward to seeing you next year. Great. Hope to be there. Thank you again. Thanks very much. Have a great day. I'll try. Bye. Bye.